Hi guys, I'm the Impaired Grappler and welcome to my podcast. Today we have a very special guest. It's my good friend Paul Matrevsky in his first ever interview. Uh, yeah, so we talk about the uh, the lockdown restrictions. Uh, we touch on his martial arts history from karate to boxing to jiu-jitsu. Uh, we talk about the martial versus art. Uh, we talk about Bruce Lee and the impact that he had on his life. Um, injuries, we go into... Uh, his neck issues and avoiding surgery through rehab. We talk about mindset, uh, taking the time to uh, give his body and mind uh, time to heal during this lockdown. Uh, we go into teaching, uh, what he learned from his students, especially the special needs kids. Uh, traveling in China, an interesting story, include, uh, which involves a triad and also avoiding a stampede. Um, yes, that's pretty full on. And we finish up talking about Uh, positivity and sort of dealing with struggles and difficulties um yeah and some inner work and stuff like that so i hope you guys enjoy and we'll catch you on the other side us hi guys i'm the impaired grappler and welcome to my podcast today we have a very special guest my good friend uh paul matreski from matreski martial arts in uh is a kielba down uh down the western suburbs there or northwest um yeah so welcome paul thanks thanks Salva. yeah this is a first time i'm sort of doing a podcast interview thing so yeah especially um for the stuff that's happening this year yeah, it's been a crap year so yeah <laughs> it's um, good to have a chat with you now Probably yeah, yeah. Him. <laughs> yeah things are easing a bit now so hopefully hopefully things um keep going this way and uh in the next week or two, I think in November, maybe we can reopen, but we'll see. Yeah. But yeah, I wouldn't, I'm not keeping fingers crossed, but. Um, yeah. It's kind of a bad sort of, uh, especially towards the end of the year, reopening, um, mm. then having to reclose coming to Christmas again. Mm. So kind of, you know, that's why I, um, I decided not to open, especially mm. with the, with the, um, you know, with the restrictions still in place for indoors, with eight square meter rule, yeah, yeah. You know, a minimum of ten people, it's it kind of, it's kind of not viable for me. Mm. You know, yeah. and then having to close again because, especially going towards the end of the year, people are going to go away this year. You know, yeah. being locked yeah, down yeah. for so long, they want to go away. They're going to go see family and that. So yeah, I made the decision just to bite the bullet and stretch it out. You know, until next year. Hopefully by then. Uh, who have no restrictions, you know, mm. but uh, you yeah. can only play the waiting game. Well, that's so, it. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so, well, yeah, um, well, you touched on it now, so it's like, um, yeah, it's just the waiting game with the, with the restrictions and all that. So, yeah, fingers crossed it all goes well. Um, yeah. So just wanted to touch on sort of um, like your martial arts history because you've, um, you're not not only – like a jiu-jitsu black belt um, recently from Pedro Sauer from like a, a couple of years ago, which was uh, pretty cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. So just, uh, can you just go into sort of what um, started your journey and what, what got you into martial arts and then sort of what martial arts you did and then uh, before uh, jiu-jitsu sort of thing? Yeah. Well, um, well, I started from a kid, yeah, with my dad was into it, uh, first of all. You know, my dad was under uh, Bob Jones, who was in Dukai, like going back in the 70s. So I would have been about seven, I would say, about seven years old when I started with my dad, who was in Dukai. Even before that, I remember him taking me, um, uh, I remember as their first, like as an old school, as, I think it was on Elizabeth Street or Flinders Street, one of them, the first Zen Dukai sort of school, if you want to call it that, at that time. Um, he used to, I used to just tag along as a little kid, but then I think it was about seven years old when I started, um, Zindu Kai. Um, and I got up to green belt, which I think was when I was about 15 years or 14 or 15 years old. And that's when we moved. So I used to live in Yarraville and after that we moved to kill, to kill downs. And that's when my dad sort of stopped training. And I think he got caught up with work and trying to pay off the house and all that. And at that point, I couldn't get there any other way. So so I sort of stopped at 15 years old with Zendu Kai. And I had that probably five-year break through high school. 
Um, and once I finished high school, um, I think I'd have been 20, maybe 20 years old. Well, before that, I was searching like through for different types of martial arts, you know, and then I found boxing. I wanted to, well, I was looking for boxing. So I went to so many different <clears throat> boxing places. I just, yeah, I didn't, I didn't like them. Just, I don't know, just didn't get a good vibe at the start. A lot of places they were training out of home. And at that time, it was expensive. I couldn't afford it. So then I had a friend who uh, said he knew a place in Footscray, um, which was the Footscray Youth Club. So, yeah, as soon as I walked in, I'll go, this is the place. Yeah, it was an old school. I just walked in and every, it was like the Rocky movie. There's posters sure. everywhere. And, um, yeah, it was just a lot of old school boxes and everyone was training, sweating. I, I really liked it, yeah. I really enjoyed it. And then I saw Bo, you know, Bo, it was, it was like Mickey, the old guy. You know, there's a couple of other old trainers there. Um, yeah, so, and at that time there, it was $5 a week, you know, for the training. Mm. It was five days a week. So it was a youth club. Um, yeah, and I joined there straight away. And the next day I went there, man, and I never turned back. And I, and I was trained there for a solid 10 years, you know. And then after that, I don't even know what year it was, man. But then I started, uh, you know, I was watching Pride at sort of towards the end there in the early 2000s, maybe 2000, maybe even a little bit earlier. So I was watching Pride and then I saw the UFC. And obviously I saw all this grappling and I'm like, man, I want to find something that's complete, that's a mixed martial art, you know. But mm. when I was doing Zendu Kai, <clears throat> even then, uh, Zendu Kai, I would call it was a freestyle karate, so it involved a bit of grappling, arm locks and stuff like that. So there's chokes and stuff. There's more striking though. But even then, I was doing a little bit of everything, you know, mm. through Zendu Kai. So and when I look back now, I know how much that was a freestyle, it was a mixture, you know, so which was pretty good. But uh, I've always been, <clears throat> I always knew that to be a complete martial artist, you have to learn everything, you know. So, especially with Bruce Lee and all that, I was really into Bruce Lee. And um, <clears throat> I was aware of all this even, at, at, you know, at a young age. So, I started searching. I would have been early 2000s. Started searching. Uh, while I was boxing, I was looking for other places. So, I went to so many different styles, um, <clears throat> you know, Burmese boxing. And I tried to find all these schools that were claiming that they were mixed, they were complete, you know. And I knew yeah. about jiu-jitsu, but I go... That, I don't want to do jiu-jitsu. I don't want to grapple on the ground. As funny, yeah. funnily, I didn't want to do jiu-jitsu then, you know? So I, I searched for everything and tried everything up but jiu-jitsu. Yeah. And then I said, man, you know, I did a bit of wrestling because at the youth club, we had one youth club, there was a wall in the middle and <clears throat> we had boxing on one side, little door, and that was wrestling on the other side. So it was an old school combination of boxing and wrestling together. So yeah. I just dabbled a little bit, not not a lot then. <clears throat> I was more into my boxing. And <clears throat> then I just happened to find a place driving past. It was in Yarraville. And I, and I read a sign, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. <clears throat> and I'm like, man, I should just give it a go. And mm. then just see how it is, man. Th that's where it is, you know. That's with the, with the gay and all this stuff. So I tried it. Yeah. And, um, yeah, from the day I tried it, I go, man, this is it, yeah? Because yeah. I got my ass handed to me, you know, and I was a very athletic, very fit person, you know, um, mm. back then. So, and I knew a little bit of wrestling. So even though I was sort of when I, the first time I tried it, even he asked me, have you done any jiu-jitsu before? I said, nah. But um, I sort of knew already how to move my body a little bit with mm. the wrestling. So, yeah, they were impressed, but, uh, yeah, and after that, yeah, I just I just started, and then I never looked back after that with jiu-jitsu. So then I was doing boxing and jiu-jitsu. Yeah, and then I, I, I still wanted the, more. Yeah, I remember the annual um, yellow pages delivery, <laughs> going through the martial arts section and like seeing that. Oh, oh, look at this one! Look at this! Look at this place! Uh, yeah, trying to find a good. Uh, yeah, like you said, mixed martial arts, sort of the Bruce Lee. Yeah, you know. You look at the cool G Kune Do ads and karate. Yeah. And it's like, oh, you know. Then the UFC came. <laughs> there was there was so many different styles I, I tried. Mm. And I, I drove everywhere, everywhere. And I just, I sort of got upset because I'm like, this is, I can't find, it's not, I can't find what I'm looking for. 
you know it's just there's nothing there it's not and not, nothing yeah it didn't attract me you know and a lot of it wasn't didn't seem realistic to me you know um when i tried it um and then i started dabbling in separate styles you know which i was already doing with boxing and jiu-jitsu you know then i, tr- I went to uh, i did a did some wing chun um you know uh i did some muay thai um and I sort of stuck with those kind of styles because I knew they were more realistic, you know. And then there was the weaponry part, which was mm. the Kali, the Filipino yeah. martial arts, you know. So over the years, I realized that there isn't – you'll never find a style, a place or a club or something that is a mix. Apart from now, now there's a different combination, yeah. Now it's all evolved, you know. But mm. even now still, the way I train – with jiu-jitsu, um, you know, I'm very more self-defense orientated, um, you know, and I incorporate striking, I incorporate weaponry, knives and stuff like that because of all the separate styles that I've trained. So mm. I'm sort of, yeah, I'll, you know, I'm, I'm highly knowledgeable in, in separate arts, you know, yeah, which has sort of led me to my, my school, you know. Uh, yeah, and that's how I've sort of progressed over the years you know, with uh, mixed martial arts, you know, what people call it now, you know. And it's kind of sad because when you say mixed martial arts, people automatically think of the cage. Yeah. You know, of the cage fighting. Mm. Um, to me, it's never been that. You know, I just knew how dominant yeah, I was to learn different areas, you know, especially with, especially with jiu-jitsu. Jiu-jitsu in the end enriched everything else that I trained, you know, just mm. because of the – your understanding of your body, the mechanics of the body. There's not, I'm, <clears throat> I've never done nothing that made me understand my body more than jiu-jitsu, which helped me with boxing, with, which helped me with, uh, you know, kickboxing and, and the Filipino martial arts and wrestling and everything. Just I learned how to combine it all, you know, hmm. instead of having one style. Even now when people do an MMA class, I, don't, I still don't think – you will still learn as much as learning the art separately and then knowing what to use and how to combine it and when to apply it, you know, in certain situations. So that's the way I sort of um, put it to practice, you know, with myself, you know. So, mm. yeah, hopefully that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, it's sort of a similar story. Like there was a lot of people searching in the late 90s, during the 90s, early 2000s, trying to find um, good jiu-jitsu. Cause, yeah, because I was doing the Japanese jiu-jitsu, but they also did a uh, Chinese, what was it, Chinese Boxing Federation kind of stuff. Yeah, Chinese did, Boxing like, is similar weapons. to like Wing Chun. Yeah, I so think. it was like Wing Chun, jiu-jitsu, and they also did like weapons and stuff. So it was, yeah. Um, yeah, it was, yeah, the it was way, interesting. The way, the way I say it is like, you know, nothing against all the, like other arts, but you know, if I want to learn how to defend against weapons, I'm not going to go do boxing, or I'm not going to go do jujitsu. Me personally, I'm mm. going to go to a style that is purely on weaponry, mm. because then I know how to defend them. I know how to be one. I know how to, I know how to use one. So then I know how to defend it. It's like a, it's like jujitsu. How do you yeah. beat a jujitsu guy? Learn jujitsu, because you know how they move. You know all their moves. You know all their attacks. And you know the defences to it. Well, there's the and argument: the best, the best uh, defence is learning all the attacks. You know, yeah, attack, exactly. attack, attack, and then you'll learn to defend better because you know exactly. what you need for the attack. Exactly. So it's like sort of reverse engineering jujitsu and um, kind of, and then that helps you reverse engineer your whole life, I guess. Yeah. Um, well, you know, boxing was a big wake up call for me um, the first time I sparred. That was a massive wake up call. That was a massive reality wake up call when I caught my first punch to the face. Hmm. You know, it's like bang, wow. You see that the you know you get the white flash, and that really woke me up. And I go, man, I need to know how to defend this. I need to know hmm. how to how to um, you know, how to how to be a boxer. You know, to take obviously in boxing you got to learn how to take punches. That's the way it is. Hmm. You know, if you want to learn proper boxing, you got to learn how to take a punch. You, know I mean? you condition yourself as you train to do it. But, yeah, it's kind of different to say, yeah, I know how to fight. But if you've never copped a punch, it changes everything. Mm. It changes yeah. everything. changes the whole dynamics, your mechanics. Everything goes out the window once you cop that shock. You, you go back into your muscle memory, don't you? 
Yeah. So whatever you train, your body's just oh, doing that, and you're not a, you're not even aware in there. Yeah, that's you know, like 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 Mike Tyson says, everyone's got a plan until mm. they get punched in the face. A punch yeah, changes exactly. everything, everything, you know. And that was my big wake up call with boxing, and that's what I actually fell in love with it more. Mm. From that, that was that was a for me that was a great experience. Just just to feel that, you know, and that was reality. Yeah. To me, that was the real that was the reality shock. And I go, man, I need to imagine in a real in a real fight in the real world, someone does that, and what are you going to do? Crumble. Hmm. You know, you sort of got to learn how to defend that. You have to, hmm. especially now, and adding jujitsu to it, it's even better. Yeah, well, once you get in there, you've got um, yeah, you, you've got other weapons to do. Oh man, to the, yeah, fall back many, on many many weapons. Because jujitsu is basically last of def- last defense. Yeah, but at the same time, with my jujitsu, it's 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 kind of helped me with everything else. With my box, even with my boxing, it's it, uh, the, the body mechanics has made me understand better in boxing. You mm. know the body mechanics of jujitsu, man, because it's so precise. Your body is so precise with jujitsu. You know your little pinky toe, you know the angle of your foot and your hip, and the, you know the things. That's why they call it invisible because you can't see it. You got to feel it. Mm. You know, and those little kind of details, understanding over the years has changed, has definitely helped me um, with everything else. So now I look at things as not as a boxing style or a Carly style or wrestling style. I look at the body as saying, how, what does the body need to move to be able to do something like a punch? Your body has to move certain parts, has to move a certain way. So that's what's, that's why it's helped me read body, you know, mm. and feel the body. So that's why I reckon Jiu Jitsu is so, is so good and so powerful. Well, it's like, it's better on your body as well, so you're not getting punched in the face. So yeah, well, getting, definitely, um, man. On the definitely helps you with defending, hundred percent. Yeah. Well, what know? about um, the boxing? Your boxing history with the CCT sort of stuff. Um, did you see a lot of that uh, back in the day with a lot of sort of you know the punch drunk kind of boxer? They used to get hit, hit in the head too much times, or you mean people? Yeah, yeah, like I, like a like coming up through the boxing scene for those for all that time. Yeah, do you see many people that were sort of like showing signs? Drunk. Yeah, um, yeah, a couple of people, not not nothing vicious, but yeah, I, I know over the years I did see a couple of shaky heads, you know, from from mm. from copping punches. So that's why the, it's a, it's it's a, it's very different. So because I come up when I started, it was a lot of the old school guys. Obviously now yeah. it's different, and sort of that's mm. what led me to leaving at that time after ten years and opening my school because through that period of involvement, it was more of the younger people started to float in, and it was more social. It wasn't a serious training. They were there just to mingle and just have a laugh. There was no serious training, and I sort of I started to lose motivation at one point because of that because I was still okay. training hard. I was always serious with my training. Mm. you know putting in the work and sort of that sort of when my motivation started to die out I I had to look for something else or you know to move away from that but yeah coming up then with the old school guys a lot of them took me under their wing is because because of my attitude and because of my mindset you know I was always there to train you know I stuck to myself. I did what I had to do. Like no one, when I went there, it's not it's not a class like you know how we have hang out. We line up. We do this instructional. No, it's like these are the rounds. I was always about three minute rounds. I was three minute round, thirty second break. So you do your skipping. You just follow what everyone does in sections, you know. And over over time, people, you know, the coaches or someone will notice you and they'll call you over. They'll fix you up a little bit. And once they see you're, you know, that you're committed and you're working. That's when they start to pull you in and start doing pad work with you or give you tips and that. So that's how I sort of – you had to earn your pad work then. Mm. Now people come in, they expect it just as normal. Yeah. You know? Well, it used so, to be like you could be at a gym for like a year and not even get looked at by the instructor. You had to earn Well, that's your, how it was. Yeah, it took me about – you know, it was a good solid six months before anyone come up to me. Mm. But that's because I was just dedicated. I shut my mouth and I just did what everyone did. I just trained, you know. Mm. And then, you know, people, st- they'll start, they'll look at you, they'll see your attitude and, you know, your personality and what you're doing. And, you know, slowly they'll put, they'll 
call you over, they'll give you a little bit of a tip, you know, this and that. And then you start to talk to people, you start making friends, and then that's how you progress, you know. And then if you're a good person, if you've got a good attitude and a good learning mindset, people will teach you. Hmm. But if you've got an ego and you're trying to be that tough guy, not many people want that, you know. You won't get a lot. People won't give you that time. But if you're committed and you show the dedication and you're training hard and they're saying you're willing to learn and you're listening to them, what they tell you, they'll give you more time, hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. That was then. Now I know it's a little bit different. And the bad thing is now is just everyone ex- you know, expects it straight away. Hmm. Instead of yeah. you've got to work yourself up to it. Yeah, for sure. So that's so like – um, yeah, sorry. Like in boxing, like thinking back, like when you're at your peak, uh, is there any is there any particular training session that you can remember that just really beat you up? Um, yeah, that you can few. remember that you. Yeah, I was. Um, I had the so there was Bo and there was his nephew Ronnie. So Ronnie, so this is the two coaches then. There was other guys there too, but I was mainly with Bo and Ronnie. So Bo was a very smart, he used to teach me um, to be more technical and very straight punches. I was more straight punching with Bo um, and get hit, not get hit, you know? Sorry, hit and not get hit, yeah. So he was a very technical boxer, uh, trainer. To, was, you know, there was no uppercuts and hooks and fancy stuff. It was just straight, had to be straight puncher. You know, and then there was Ronnie, and Ronnie was the hard one. That was his nephew. He was he was more younger. He was very aggressive, so he's the one that got my conditioning up like flat out. So I remember a lot of times like I don't have video footage of it then because just no one had their cameras and yeah, records yeah. and stuff like that. So it's very we didn't even have music. There was no I trained with no music for a very long time. So that sort of taught you to 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 focus a lot and concentrate on your training. You know, without without any kind of music to pump you up or to motivate you. So that's how I, I got used to that with my own mind, you know, to, to, to just go through that mental, the mental battle through the physical stuff. Yeah, but he used to, I, I remember heaps of times of him just pushing and pushing where I thought I'm going to die, you know, hmm. but I kept breaking through. You know, there's many times I ran out where I thought I was going to, you know, I had to go to the toilet. You know, just everything feels like it's going to let go from pure exhaustion. You know, you've just gassed yourself out. And times where, you know, you think you, you – so this is the thing is when you get to a point where you want to give up, like you're that tired, you just can't – your arms can't do it, you can't breathe, you can't do this, you're just completely gone. And he'll push you for that little bit more, just that little bit more, whether it's 10 seconds more, whether it's 15 seconds more. And then at the end, you'll say, man, see, you did another 15 seconds, so you can do it. Hmm. But that's where the mental, that's how the mental sort of strength develops. Is you just you, bit by bit, you just push, but he used to push me hard. And, you know, if I had my guard down when I was doing, this is just, this is with pad work. If I had my guard down, I'd cop cracks, you know, to the face. He'd cut me, I'd get cuts with my eyes, you know, on my eyes from the, from the pad work. If I dropped my hands, and I didn't complain about it, I actually enjoyed it because it made me, realize to defend i'll keep my hands up you know not having people always tell you keep your hands up keep your hands up keep your hands up keep your hands up you know and then you don't say nothing and the hands don't come up because they're so used to waiting to hear you say it mm. where he just used to go whack you learn very <laughs> Good way quickly to learn. put your hands up Good way to learn. You know? so i remember that and, and a lot of a lot of the sparring um some hard sparring where it was against bigger guys and just very exhausted where you just got to keep going. You keep going. You're taking punches, but you just keep going, you know, where, yeah. And at the end of the days, you just, at the end of the class, you just, you're dragging your feet. I used to love that feeling. Just you're completely exhausted. You know, you've had a hard session and you're just dragging your feet. You drag them out of the gym. So that was, so I remember a lot of those days because they were two hour sessions. So they were two hour sessions and that was very intense especially having three minute rounds, 30 second, uh, so, yeah, 30 second break it was. No, 15 seconds, sorry. That was a 15 second break on the timer, not 30, 15 seconds. And I used to push myself and be very strict on that 15 second break. So the bell would go, it was an old school bell, it wasn't a digital timer, it was an actual clock and, and the ringer. Um, so 
you the bell would go, you you'll go have a quick sip, come back, you're ready before the 15 second break, and you just go, you know. So that's what I remember mm. a lot about that, you know, in those 10 years there, which um, definitely helped me develop my mental strength. Definitely. Mm. So um, what about uh, sort of, because like lately, the last few years we've been having a lot of the art of the martial art of jiu-jitsu sort of representing itself. When's it time for the, uh, to represent the martial aspect of the art instead of the art aspect? Um, the martial, I would say, Man, this year would have been a good time. <laughs> you know, this year would have been a good time. There's, well, there's different ways, yeah? It's either in combat or in mm. the mental battle with yourself. That's the martial part, to keep fighting, to fight. Well, we kind of have to the, do the mental part at the moment as well, yeah? yeah. Like that's sort of, we're sort of forced into that situation worldwide at the moment, but especially yeah, in because, Melbourne. you know, with, with physical, anybody can just get angry and punch. Mm. Yeah. You know, a- anybody can get angry and just yell at someone or fight. But it's not about that, you know. It's about the purpose of it as well. Can you, can you, yeah, if you can hit someone, but can you fight with yourself in a mental battle? Can you deal with that? You know, when you want to quit, can you fight to keep going? You know, so the martial part, I would say it's not just in physical combat, but in those kind of other areas of life. It's, it's easy to just to go hit someone and punch someone. Hmm. You know, that's part of the martial part of combat, you know, to fight. But fight has to be in, your whole life in other areas too, you know, hmm. that's, that's the way I sort of see it. And mainly to protect people, protect vulnerable people, weaker, weaker people, you know, to defend your family, hmm. your friends or whatever, and yourself, obviously. Sometimes you, you know, you, you may be training your whole life and never have to use it, which is probably a good thing. But yeah. you know, the time that you do have to use it, you do have to fight. It's going to save you or it's going to save someone. It's better to have it and never need to use it. 100%, you know, and there's more to it. The confidence mm. it gives you that you know you can, you know, you can know you can, you can take care of yourself and help others. You just have the confidence to help others, you know. It's not just you're scared, you're worried, you know, what's going to happen to you. It gives you the confidence to be more, you know, to be more willing to jump in or help someone if someone's on an attack or, you know, something, you see something that's, you know, not right. Mm. You know, yeah. so that's that's the way I see it. It's also speaking up when you see something uh, yeah, wrong happening. Yeah, speaking up, doing some, taking yeah. action, taking Take action. action. You know, like I said, whether it's a physical action or whether it's a uh, uh, you know verbal or is the the confidence to step in. So hmm. that's I believe the martial part is is all linked with that. You know. That's, that's why I say obviously martial arts is predominantly first for battle, for combat. Mm. Yeah. And, and I believe through that, that's where all the mental stuff comes in, the physical part, and obviously floats into the art, the philosophy, you know, mm. the techniques and all of that kind of stuff. So yeah, I would say the, the battling is less technique. The art is more technique, detail, philosophy. But it's you like you, you can't be a – the martial part can't be isn't good without the art, and the art part yeah, isn't good without separated. the martial. Yeah, correct. You need the martial to back to be able to be artistic, but you need the art to be able to be martial. Yeah, that's think, right. If that it's makes yin, sense, yin, 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 uh, yin and yang. Yeah, yin and yang. Yeah, yin and yang. The duality so that's, of that's human where it all nature. Comes in. Uh, but the problem is now a lot of people are just doing it for martial. They're training now for mm. martial only. They don't have the yeah. art. That's why there's the ego, there's the ego, there's the attitude, there's that tough character, you know, they want to, uh, it's, 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 you know, it's all, it's all external. It's all about external to be the tough guy. Mm. Now. That's the way I see it when people wanting to train, which is but, not a really purpose. It's not, it's not, there's no other purpose to it anymore. You well, know, the, old, people, the old reasons, the old martial arts, the traditional martial arts, they'll teach you these lessons by just drilling it into your head. Because, yeah. but then in jujitsu, you learn the same lessons because your your ego is getting smashed at the do- like on the mats every day. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you you learn the lessons that the traditional martial arts have always taught you, but that you actually get from the more you fight. Correct. Yeah. It's, it's yeah because it's very physical. Jujitsu is very physical, so you got no choice with jujitsu. 
Mm. Yeah, you got no choice when you're on the bottom and someone's smashing you on top. Well, you got to tap. Yeah, and, the, and there's no holding back, so you know. Oh, oh, yeah, I was, you know, because I didn't want to hit you hard. I didn't hit you enough. You yeah. know, I didn't use my uh, killer palm technique. You know, yeah, but, but that's um, right. So that's why jiu jitsu. It's um, uh, how can I say? That's why people go can go more. You know, especially a beginner, they got hundred percent in jiu jitsu. They feel a little bit more safer. But I bet you, you put that same person. The beginner that tried jiu-jitsu, you put him in a boxing ring to do that, he won't do that because mm. they know the outcome with boxing. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's the difference. And that's why jiu-jitsu, I believe, gives a bit more confidence at the start for the, a person bigger to use their strength. And that's why they feel like they need to use their strength, you know, because obviously it's a little bit different to boxing. Mm. You know? Yeah. So, yeah, you know, but you have to have both, I believe. Because you know you you can be a good fighter, but doesn't mean doesn't mean you know you're a humble person. Mm. It doesn't mean that you're any good. You might be just a skilled fighter, but if you got nothing else with it, I don't mm. think that's any any kind of benefit. Well, that kind of segues into uh, Bruce Lee and the impact Bruce Lee had on us, because like it was more he it wasn't just his martial art or whatever. <coughs> Um, it was it was everything. It was the philosophy. It was the sort of state of mind and how he presented himself and all that sort oh, of yeah. stuff. Yeah, so, his philosophy still to this day. I still read his books. Actually, I got one here. I don't know where it is. If I can find it, somewhere here. I don't know where I put it. Ah, that's cool. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I read a lot of his books with his philosophy and his philosophy just makes sense to me, mm. you know? And it's from the martial arts, he's drawn it and he applies it to life, you know? Mm. So this is this is why, yeah, his philosophy is just is, is on point, even till now, still. So yeah, that's why he's, he's very influential for me still to this day and as a kid, mm. you know, he's been very, yeah. very influ influential to me. And you went to his graveside at uh, was it Seattle? Yeah, in Seattle, man. Yeah, that was um very oh, man. That was a list. That was a a dream of mine <laughs> as a kid because I used to watch. I remember I watched um what's that movie? Uh, no retreat, no surrender. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, he was the ghost. comes alive in his, you know, and he yeah. starts training him and that. I, I used to think that was real. That can happen, you know. And then he visited uh, his grave when he was crying there, and I go, man, I need to, I need to go there one day. I want to go there. Mm. So, yeah, and I, I made it happen. Um, and funnily, you know, it was emotional too. When I got there, I got emotional. I didn't think I would, but I did. Mm. So, yeah, it was very it was very emotional for me. I don't know why. It's kind of strange. But, you yeah, was I was by myself there. It was cool it was just to be there, you know. Cause just I think, the energy of the place. Yeah, the energy, the impact he's had, you know, um, on my life with just his his – more for, and I'll say now, as I'm older, it's more his philosophy as well, just his intelligence mm. through the martial arts, the way he used to think, um, just makes sense. It's because it's the way I think. Mm. You know, it, it relates to me a lot. So, well, I think he's yeah. helped the martial arts um, so much, especially in the West and just worldwide. He's helped it, just spread it, and help teach everyone and give the. The power back to the people. In yeah, terms well, of that's why he's to... so different because he was, you know, it wasn't. A, uh, he was he was always fighting against racism mm. and all that kind of stuff. You know, it wasn't just teach one culture or one, you know, race. Man, he was. That's 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 pure martial artist. He, it's about sharing his knowledge, helping people. You mm. know, and that's why he was very influential in that way. You know, because now, even now, you know, you got cults in martial arts, like schools, academies, there's groups, there's, mm. there's separation, there's division, you know, I see it, you know, I've seen it firsthand. Mm. So, you know, it still happens. It's, there's no, di it's no different. So that's why I really like, like I said, his life, his, um, his philosophy, I'll call it his philosophy, was just more than about fighting. It's got to do with life, being as, what kind of human being you are, mm. you know? especially for all that kind of stuff. He didn't care what color were you, what race you were, it doesn't matter, but uh, were you a good person? 
Mm. You know, and he, the only way he could teach was through his um, through his martial arts. That, that's the way he helps you express yourself. You know, through movement, through whatever, through anger. So, yeah, yeah, he's very big. Yeah, he's a influential, and like, yeah, very powerful message. Yeah, I mean, he probably like shaped martial arts for all of us as kids and got us interested. And then when the UFC came along, I think like. Um, the seed was planted from Bruce Lee and then when the UFC came along, it just sort of grew, grew into a, a bountiful, like, look now how many gyms there are and how many people are doing uh, jiu-jitsu and martial yep. arts in general and all that around the world, especially with the UFC and how popular it's become. But, yeah, like, he's a big part to that. 100%, 100%. You know, yeah, jiu-jitsu, jiu-jitsu changed the world too, but... Um, and I believe, I truly believe, if he was still alive, there's no doubt that he would have been doing jiu-jitsu. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's no doubt. Because I know he was dabbling in grappling anyway then with Gene yeah, LaBelle. Gene LaBelle. Yeah. So he was dabbling with grappling. And obviously, uh, he's, his A couple best of arm bars. Is, yeah. Well, movies. there was Danny Nasanto, which is, you know, mm. I think he's the third degree um, black belt under the Machados, you know? So obviously mm. they would have been training together still. They would have gone down the path of jiu-jitsu. There was no other choice. Yeah. Yeah. yeah There's no other he was choice. looking for the effectiveness. And- yeah. He would have realized that, oh, that would have been, that would have been, that would be so cool if he was still alive to go through that and see the evolution now with jiu-jitsu. Mm. Oh, that would have been amazing, you know? Because he was just way overhead, way ahead of his time then. Oh, Yeah. You know, so to imagine it now, what he would be like, yeah, that, 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 that'd that be crazy to, to see, for sure. Yeah, and if you, like you watch his movies now, they still hold up. I still like love the them. Fights, no. The fight scenes, like you watch another, you watch other movies and like the fight scenes, oh, it's a bit tacky, it's a bit corny, oh, that's fake. You know, like watching it, you know, what, what is it, 50 years later or whatever. Yeah. But like, one still sort of hold up, all right. <laughs> it's man, like, I still watch it like it's, like it's a 2020 movie, man, you know? Yeah. Because they're real fight scenes kind of thing, you know? Yeah. It's real proper martial arts choreographing it properly, you know? Well, that's what's yeah. so good about him because he's yeah. the one that choreographed it. He directed, especially Enter the Dragon, his last movie. he done everything. Oh, that was awesome. he done everything. So he that's why he had an art. That's the art part. He had an eye, mm. you know, good visual yeah. of art. So he could see that and angles and this, that, and, and very intelligent, very intelligent, very, very smart. You know, especially through martial arts. And he even says it is in, in his interviews, everything he's gained, all the knowledge was from martial arts. Mm. Yeah. You know, he says it is in his interview. Yeah, he's, oh. a, uh, he's an inspiration to all of us. But, um, yeah, I just wanted to sort of touch on sort of your, like your history of injuries. You've had like uh, the sort of the neck issues uh, lately. Um, yeah, if you so, can sort of go into that and what, um, if there's yeah, anything that you, you, any operations or any procedures you did that you would sort of regret or would change now given the new modalities that are out there and stuff? Yeah. I've had no surgeries, like thankfully. I've been very close. I, should, I need them. But I've, I've, I'm stretching out as long as I can not to have them because I know, I don't really want to have surgeries. You know, I've broken a lot of stuff. Um, yeah, I've had uh, I've lost count. To be honest, man, my body's pretty battered. You know, especially as for, more from jujitsu. But reason being is when I first started, I was on the the training mats that we had. That was my main mm. injuries okay. because we trained. I think they were taekwondo mats, which were I don't know fifteen or twenty mil just directly on concrete. So that's all I knew. That was the only thing. Mm. I didn't know anything else then because that's what I started on. And we would wrestle on it, you know, no knee pads. It was like concrete. Now Mm. I cringe. There's no way I could do it. There's no way. But all my injuries over the years and just that that aggression is very different to now, the way I teach my, you know, in my school. Like rarely people get injured because of the methods you know, the, how it's structured, and I'm really cautious with people just going crazy. I'll pull it up straight mm. away. Where when I started, I was like, go hard or go home. That was it. You yeah, know? basically. So, yeah, but my, my biggest injury, I would say, would be my neck. But I first injured it, um, oh, what are we now, 2000? A good eight years ago, eight years ago maybe. 
I think it was at least eight years, maybe 10 years, 10 years ago. So I was sort of grappling with uh, my coach Harkin at the time and he was on Mount. And at that time we got taught to bridge on our heads. So that's, you know, as a wrestler, sort of the wrestler's over bridge our, over our head. So that's how I used to bridge. It was really explosive. Um, and as I tried to bridge, I bridged off onto my head and he sort of, he was attached to me on my chest, but he dismounted with his, the rest of his body. So as he was attached to my upper body, while I was bridged, I crushed uh, sort of my neck, got caught in the mat and his weight and it crushed my neck. So, um, yeah, and I crushed three nerves in my neck and instantly my, my left side just, just sort of dropped like I had a stroke. Mm. You know, just, I mean, well, it just drooped. And he goes, what's wrong with your face? And I go, I don't know. So when I had a look in the mirror, and that's when I said, it's all just dropped. Um, so I just iced it and let it cool down for about an hour. And, you know, my face come back. But being then, I was a little bit more egotistic then. I just thought, oh, 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 you know, nothing, it's all right. It's gone away. I just keep training, never got treatment. That's, mm. that's, that's my regret. My regrets are not treating my injuries mm. and, just, and just keep just training through them like nothing's happened. So that was a bit stupid. You can still train through injuries. I still train through injuries now, but I, I can go around them. You know, instead, of the, instead of training and, and still impacting the injury, which, I, which, is, which is, that's what I did. Mm. So, yeah. And then obviously through the 10, 10 years, that was, wasn't as bad up until this year, at the start of the year when I went to Thailand. Um, and I was doing a bit of Muay Thai. And after a session of clinching, he was a tall, tall experience, one of their fighters, tall, tall guy. Um, you know, a solid half an hour of clinching on my neck. I didn't feel it then. It was after, after the class. And I, just, I couldn't keep my head up. I just kept falling. So I was that fatigued in my mm. neck. And it was a little bit of pain. And then the next day I was just sore and I started shooting down my back, which that's where I had the pain anyway. But then it happened while I went to another place um, with jiu-jitsu. So I had a couple of beginners there, just I was going easy, rolling. And I had a guy like latch onto me. He was on the bottom. I was on the knee right position, just floating with him, not putting any hard pressure or nothing. And he had two hands anchored on my, on my head. He's trying to pull my head down while I was on the knee right. So, but I usually, I had good posture, I had good structure and just something tweaked already because of the injury previously from uh, the Muay Thai clinch. So yeah, that triggered, that's when I really triggered down my back and I felt it shoot down my arm and I said, and I stopped. And after that, yeah, I was in a lot of pain for the next two weeks in Thailand because there was no, uh, no osteos. There's nothing like that there that I could get treatment. It was just normal massages. Mm. so yeah that didn't help so I was taking and I had spasms for four days non-stop from my neck my arm was just spasming non-stop so I had to deal with the pain there was no other there's nothing I could do I couldn't even find the cricket ball to buy to roll it you know or anything like that mm. so I had to use a deodorant can <laughs> in my uh, hotel room on the brick wall just to try and massage it out or something you know but and yeah, as my nerve that was pinched, yeah, it was pretty bad. But I think one of the massages could have triggered it even worse. Because mm. um, I went and saw one of the guys from one of the trainers days. He gave me his massage, dude. And he he batted me for an hour. Like I've never had, I've never been in that much pain from a massage apart from this guy. So I think he might have triggered it, mm. you know, a little bit more until I got back. And that's when I came back, I saw a couple of people and I tried to do push-ups. So as I tried to do a push-up, I went to the training and I just fell on my face. So I had no strength in my arm. So that's when I realized something's, something's pretty serious. So and I got scared, you know, and I went straight to my local doctor, told him what happened. And he gave me a referral to go straight to uh, emergency to go see a neurosurgeon. You know, because of my nerve, it, I, he didn't know how bad it was. So I went there, I had to get MRI and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, and then when I got the result back, I went and saw him again, and it wasn't a good, it wasn't a good uh, answer. Yeah, that he gave me. So he told me, look, he goes, your neck's pretty stuffed. Um, you know, all your facet joints are gone. You know, there's your C seven and C six, C six nerves are pinched. 
So that's what's killed your arm. And, you know, the outcome of that is if you leave it too long, because my arm went to jelly. Like my arm was just jelly from yeah. that. So obviously that was from the from the impingement. And that's why I had no strength. So you can get to a point where you completely lose everything, you know, from that arm. So, and it quickly, quickly started shrinking very quick. Mm. So, yeah, once he told me you need the surgery and the only option he gave me was to fuse my neck. And I'm like, well, I, you know, I, and, and look, I, I went to t- into tears from that. When he told me that, I had no option because I definitely didn't want to get a neck fuse, mm. you know. And, and I told him, what, isn't, you know, there's no, isn't there any other options? Like, we can get, you know, the disc replacements or something instead of a fused neck. And he goes, no, he goes, I'm highly experienced. He goes, um, you know, and there's a good record of, you know, people with fused necks. But, yeah, I just didn't want a fused neck, man. I didn't know mm. how to take it. So he prescribed an injection, a cortisone injection in my C7 nerve. So I went and got that first. He goes, take this injection. He goes, and see how you go after a couple of weeks. And I had to go back. But I just... And at the same time, I didn't like the vibe of him, to be honest. Mm. I just I didn't like the vibe of him because he just get, he gave me no options. There was no rehabbing or nothing like that. It was just like you need a fuse neck, uh, you need a fuse your neck, and that was it. So yeah, it took me a few days to sort of let it sink in and think about it because I started doubting myself. You know, I started believing him, and I'm not I'm not usually like that. So I had a chat to my coach Harkin because he's had neck surgery. So, and even he told me, um, yeah, don't get it. Don't get a surgery, whatever you do. So then I go, I'm going to sort out some other neurosurgeons. So I went and sorted out two other neurosurgeons, the two top neurosurgeons in Melbourne, privately. Um, explained the whole story to them, what I do and everything like that, how long and all this kind of stuff. And even they said to me, man, don't rush into the surgery. They go from what you do. They go, you're pretty. You, you, they go, you're strong. You, tr- you've trained most of your life, so they go, you're prepared to do a rehab. Your body is prepared for a rehab for rehab instead of just mm. going under the knife. So, and that was the first one, and that was pretty good, yeah. So, and he said, look, in the end, you go, you guys, there is other options instead of going straight to fusing your neck. So then I went and saw the other one, and sort of same thing, you know. He said, you're pretty strong. He goes, I can see. And they do all these tests on you as well. And he goes, same thing because, you know, of all your training in that, he goes, your body is prepared to go through the rehab exercises. He goes, if it was someone normal that's not trained, that hasn't been physically training in their life, he goes, I would instantly say, you know, get the surgery because their body's not prepared. Mm. So, mm. yeah, that's all I wanted. I got that those two different views. And that's when I said, all right, I'm going to go search for someone to do rehab my neck you know and asked a few people uh bumped into a friend he gave me a guy named andrew lock so he's up in uh i think chadston or dandenong somewhere up there frankston no dandenong chadston so he's a physio as well and he's a strong man you know uh, bodybuilder power lifter Mm. so i went and saw him and he's rated as one of the top in the world you know so i went and saw him and he gave me exercises to do and before that, I was already starting to do push-ups and trying to train my arm up and to get my strength back and all that kind of stuff. So I explained to him what I was doing and I was working. So I just kept doing that and he gave me some exercises and I just committed to that. And I started mm. getting better and better. You know, from one push-up, I started to do three and build up all the way out until I got up to 100 a day. So I got up to 100 push-ups a day eventually. Um, but I just didn't give up. That's where I say now, that's where the mental battle is. You just don't give up. You just keep mm-hmm. going. It doesn't matter how hard it is. You want to quit. You want to cry. You want to do this. You know, and I was depressed because, okay, you know, I'll, I'm thinking that, that my arm's gone. My neck's stuffed and that's it. You know, so I had to push through it and I really trained and committed to it. So then I started doing another strength and conditioning program with another guy, Andrew Reed, um, throughout this year to keep me going. Um, and I've definitely, uh, till now, I feel so much better. My neck's good. I bought the iron neck. I was committed to the iron neck um, for a solid six months every day, nonstop. Okay. So the iron neck, I guess, with doing the push-ups, doing the rehab exercises, all these combined 
I think have helped me now. So okay. I, don't, I haven't even got pain anymore. I know it's still there. I can get triggered, but I just have to maintain it when it does happen and ease up. What about your lower back? My uh, lower back, I, at one stage I did have issues and that would have been last year. Yeah, I had. I couldn't find the problem with it. I had tests and scans and I almost felt like I was inside deep in my hip, like down, mm. deep, deep, deep mm. in my back. I had a lot of issues. Even when I twisted and turned, it felt bruised. Um, and I don't know what happened, but it sort of faded away. But I know with jiu-jitsu, eventually, um, if you're a big guard player and all, your back's always mm. getting loaded, it can happen. You know? And I know people that have had bad backs from it. Yeah, bad backs, hips. <laughs> yeah, my hips feel okay. Um, I do believe that my hamstrings, like my hamstrings, from being curled up in a guard position, your hamstrings shorten. Mm. Because you you got your knees up like you know with your with your guard, so over the years your body molds to that, mm. you know, and obviously you get other issues. So yeah, you really got to balance yourself, which I do now more, you know, more stretching and stuff like that. You know, focusing on um, certain muscle groups for jujitsu, you know. So, but yeah, so far you know especially for all this stuff going on, you know, then my gym closed. So I had a lot of stuff to deal with, but it was more, you know, and I said to myself this year, I have to focus now. I've got the time I'm closed. I have to focus on myself, mm -hmm. you know, and I really purely I committed to myself for this year and yeah, I've lost weight. I got up to 89 kilos at the start because they gave me some uh, medication. Um, for my neck and that blew me out to 89 kilos so i mm. felt crap I was, I was feeling depressed i was sad i didn't know what the i had so many emotions and then they closed the gym and I was like man like <laughs> what else can happen so yeah that mm. was just a i had to i had to switch my mind straight away you know and and it was just a working progress up until now you know and i've lost 14 kilos i'm down to 75 kilos so you know a lot of running a lot of training. I'm doing all my chin-ups and push-ups and weightlifting now. Um, so I feel good now compared to the start of the year. Yeah, nice. You know? I feel, well, I feel that, yeah, good. It's, it's good that you've had the time to sort of let your body recover because otherwise you just would have continued working through it and going teaching jiu-jitsu and taking it one day at a time. Yeah, that's the hardest part, man, is because I – I commit to my school, to my academy, um, and I'm there in every class. I'm, I'm, I'm physically involved in every class. I do the inquiries. So it's just a one-man band for me. So it's a lot mm. of time, uh, you know, that I put into my academy. And I, and I sort of – and I know and like, because the last two years, because I went full-time, I had to commit to growing growing it, trying to grow it through a business, mm. you know, the business side of it. So I knew I had to – sort of neglect myself a little bit and focus on that part. And this year I got to focus now on myself because the way yeah. I say it is if you're not mentally stable yourself, if you're not healthy yourself, you're no good to nobody, you know? So if I just sit there and keep focusing on others all the time, I'll lose myself and I'll become unhealthy. That's yeah. the way I see it. So I use that this year to, 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 to get my health up my mental strength back in, get myself conditioned. I feel mm. good now. I feel, I feel good, you know? So, and uh, yeah, it was, when I open, I'm going to have a different mindset. I feel healthy. Mm. Yeah. I feel a lot more clarity. I feel clear, you know, um, my food, my food has been super clean. Um, so yeah, everything, everything has just been very healthy this year for me. Mm. So, which has definitely helped where some people will use this as a time to sort of get themselves down. Mm. You know, and, 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 you know, play the blame game or oh, this happened and that happened. That's why I'm like this. And I'm like that. I, 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 I refuse to be like that. Mm. You know? Yeah. The, the sort of victim mindset. Yeah. I don't like that. I'll never do that. You know, I'll yeah. snap myself out of it. I'll force myself. There's times I don't want to do, I don't want to train. I don't want to run, you know, but I just, I'm telling myself, I don't want to do it as I'm putting on my shoes, man, mm. you know, but I'm going to keep doing it. You just do it. Whether I feel I liked it or not, I just did it, man. And I'm always, always feel better when it's done. Always. I'll never, you never regret it. 
<laughs> yeah, you, you never, you never you know, say. I knew I should done, have done that workout. Hmm. You only regret it if you don't do it. And you said, "Man, I should have done it. I should have just done it. I should have just pushed through it." You know, yeah, and that's when you start to yeah. regret. Yeah, it's just uh, about getting into a routine. Yeah, you got to commit. You know, I, I'm a very, I'm a very, uh, I'm very committed. Yeah, I'm very. You know, when I put my mind to something, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm kind of obsessive. I'm obsessed with when you know when I'm on a mission, nothing can stop me. Like nothing. Mm. That's the way. I, I'm super focused. I'm super determined. Whether whatever happens around me, that's my mission. I, I'm going for it. I'm, I just attack it. You know. So yeah, that's kind of my mindset when it comes to things like that, especially you know with times tough, especially with struggles and difficulties. That's when you need to push. That's when martial arts comes into play. You can mm. be a tough guy on the mat. But if you can't handle those kind of stuff in life, when you know stuff like that happens to you, then it's it's pointless. Well, like you said before, with the martial arts, it's like you you don't get better unless you sort of get in there and get beat up and sort of lose, yeah. and then so you have to go so through like the struggle. You, you need have the to struggle. Go the difficulties. Mm. You no, know? it's like a side control. There's no other way. When you're in side control, you're going to get your face smashed. You're going to get squashed. You're going to eat dirt. That's what I say to everyone. Everybody eats dirt in jiu-jitsu or the mat. Mm. Everybody, you know? Yeah. There's, you can't get away from it. And the people that don't like it are the ones that quit, that leave. Mm. Or they go to somewhere where they know they can beat everyone up. Well, you yeah, know, yeah. They, kinda, they have that kind of mindset, which I don't like, you know? And obviously, there's a certain level then you have to give back. It's not just about you taking you have to give back hmm. and you want to be that kind of training partner anyway from the start you want to be the give and take person not just the person that takes all the time take 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 you know you have to give you have to you have to help you have to contribute you know back to your club or to your team or to whoever you know hmm. if, you, if you're not good as an individual you can't be good as a team yeah exactly <laughs> you know that's the way i sort of see it so it always comes down to to the individual, you know. But then yeah. you know, and but like say with martial arts, like it does crush your ego, but especially with jiu-jitsu. But at the same time, what's happening now is people with bad attitudes and bad mindsets understand how powerful jiu-jitsu is now. So mm. those bad people are learning it as well. Yeah, not just the good, there's mm. good, obviously there's the good yeah, people yeah. and the humble people and the learning mm. people, but now there's also the bad people doing it. So that only, you know, when the bad people, empowers them even more. Well, there's no um, sort of the old Helio Gracie, would, he was notorious for not giving out black belts to a lot of his brown belts, didn't matter how long they were there. He's like, no, you're not, you, don't, you don't know jiu-jitsu. You've never learned the lessons, <laughs> yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, because they're like, no, no, you're just, it's like, no, I'm not giving you a black belt. It's like, okay, wow, that's, you know, it's not just based on time, it's based on everything and the attitudes and that. Yeah, so. that's how I think too. It's not just on your time, it's not just on your skills, but how you are as a person. What what do you, mm. what you do with the jiu-jitsu, you know? Um, yeah, it's not just about how tough you are. There's a lot of tough people. Mm. There's, a, there's a lot of skillful people, but they're not good human beings, you know? I know well, it, I know, I, I see it. I see it. Mm. And obviously there's more of a coming out where you've got instructors and, you know, obviously all this kind of other stuff that, they, you know, they're in bad, they do bad things with mm. it. And they use it to an advantage, you know, against weaker people. Yeah. So, yeah, for me, your attitude plays a massive part. Mm. If you don't have the right attitude and you come into my school wanting to learn, I always question people when people come in and say, oh, especially people that come in and say, I want to fight. Mm. You know, and I'm like, okay, for what's your purpose of it though? Why do you want to fight? You know, and I've had people come in, oh man, I just want to smash people. I would, I'll, I'll never teach a person that. A person mm. with that attitude, I'll never teach. I don't want that attitude. Mm. And people say, yeah, but you got to give them a chance. You might change them. Yeah, you, you might not either. Mm. You know, as well, because they've got this mindset already in their head. Yeah, you're starting. Uh, Starting from 100 meters behind in the race. Yeah, you know. So I, I don't like that, me personally. But if someone comes up to me, you know, 
uh, you know, I want to gain a million confidence or I want to I want to change my lifestyle. I want to learn self-defense. I want to, you know, some people come in with anxiety or depression. I've had a lot of people like disabilities. I have a lot of kids that have come through with disabilities, autistic kids, you know, mm. you know kids with Asperger's, um, mm. you know, uh, MS, stuff like that. I, I accept all of them. Yeah. You know, because I know I can help them. Yeah, I enjoy I enjoy helping teaching sort of especially yeah, like those sorts of children as well. It's just like and you can see it in them, they sort of want to learn and they're they're interested and sort of excited about it, you know. Yeah, but for me it's more about making them believe that they're not different and they can learn. Mm. You mm. know, they're not they're not separate. They're yeah. not different to other people. There's they can learn in their own kind of way. So me that's what I enjoy being as an instructor is finding how that person or that kid learns how he can understand it. How can I teach this kid to understand his body or his mind, you know? So that's where a good instructor is. It's not just teaching him your way, one way. How do you help him or her find their own way with, you know, if they got a disability as well, you mm. know? I've lived with him a whole life. My brother, he's mentally slow, my brother, you know? So I've had to deal with him all my life. I've had to... I've had countless fights with him, not with him, but people that have teased him. Mm. You know, I've always had to be the bigger brother and he's the older one. Mm. So, you know, so when it comes to that kind of stuff with people, I, I'm, yeah, I'm down for a hundred percent straight away to help mm. people like that because I believe those people can learn and I enjoy it. But the hardest thing is those people don't last long, whether it's from mm. the parents or obviously like some kids find it difficult, too difficult. And then the parents will pull them out, which that 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 saddens me, you know. So it's the kind of thing that takes it takes a fair bit of time, but uh, yeah, and that's another frustrating still- thing with days because I put a lot of time. Mm. Um, that's been the most out of all my years, you know. As especially having my school and being an instructor is the time spent with so many different with adults or kids. It doesn't matter. You spend a lot of time trying to teach them, and then they just leave. Mm. Then the next person comes in, you you know, it's, just, it's continuous. I used, to, I used to get really frustrated in my earlier years, more so. I've learned to be more patient now, though. But And now I accept a little bit more that it's going to happen. You, you, you probably waste more time than you do than the people who stick around, you know. Mm. Trying to get people to stay, that's the hardest thing. You can't force nobody, but... It's it's frustrating for me because for me time is the most precious thing in life, you know. And then when you're waste, I wouldn't say wasting it, but you do end up wasting because you've given this person so much time, and then they leave. Where you could have mm. given to someone that's more committed, you know, or someone that's wants to change their lifestyle or something like that. Yeah, that's the hardest part. That that's that frustrates me the most. I would say. You know, as 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 a coach, as a school owner. So as a, so like yeah, as a coach and school owner, what, what's the? So well, maybe you just answered the question, but what's the number one thing you've learnt from teaching, or like from your students, or from teaching? From teaching, um, patience. Patience. A lot. A lot of people tell me they go, "You're super patient," and. Mm. I would say, yeah, I'm patient. Yeah, definitely. Now I'm patient. Obviously. I get frustrated. That's normal. I'm not going to say I don't mm. get frustrated, um, but definitely patient. I understand a little bit more now when mm. um, a beginner, because I have so many mixed, I have little kids, I have older adults, I have uh, you know uh, girls, teenagers, women. So everybody's different and some people learn different. That's what I learn is people learn differently. Some people understand quicker, some people are more mature, some people don't. So some people progress slower, some people progress quicker. So what I've learned is how to try and teach a group, but individually at the same time. Mm. Yeah, to make everybody understand. And and I learned more from teaching kids because how to make a kid understand and break it down so simple that a kid can understand. So when you learn how to do that, then explaining it to other people to, especially to adults is should be easier 
you know, you don't want to explain yeah. it a hundred steps. You want to make it so simplified that they can understand it. And the way I, I sort of teach it is to find a way that that person can relate it in, in, in something that they do in their life, hmm. something that they do commonly, like as a, as a, as a, as a daily, whatever it is, you know, if you can relate it to that, they get to, I, I, this is how I used to test myself. Like if I was trying to teach someone, you know, say for example, in jujitsu to use your hooks. So if I'm teaching, a, this is say, if I've got an adult man, I'm trying to teach him how to use his hook to put his foot. So, and we've all done this. I'll say when you, you know, when you take your when you take your jocks off in the bathroom or something, and you pick it up with your foot and you flick it up with a hook. Hmm. So if I describe it in that way, he'll that person will understand it because it's common. Because every we've all done it, we've all flicked up our t-shirts hmm. or whatever with our foot. Hmm. So I would explain it in that way instead of trying to break the mechanics down where it, he, they get frustrated and they get confused. Mm. So I would use that kind of scenario and they get it, they understand that much quicker. So, but this is, you know, and I'll test different ways. Yeah. But yeah. That's the way I say it, is to try and relate it to something that, uh, that most people do commonly and it helps them learn quicker. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good way of uh, d doing it, but it doesn't always uh, work. Sometimes you can sort of miss on trying to hit that metaphor and they'll be like, what? Scratching their heads. Um, yeah. And that's where sometimes then you'll have to, you'll, you'll change each, another way. Yeah, you'll add to yeah. it or you might try another way of teaching. Mm. Um, you might give him an object to try and do that move or something, you know, give, yeah. give him something so he can get the idea of what, how he has to move mm. to do it. Yeah. All right. So um, I just wanted to sort of finish up on uh, tra uh, traveling, your experience traveling. Like every year you, you generally take um, time off and go traveling to a new destination around the world. Uh, and you've had a few interesting experiences. I was hoping you could uh, uh, tell us about some of those, especially there was one in China. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah. Yeah, I've traveled quite a bit. I've done a lot of Asia. Um, obviously Brazil, America, but mm. yeah, the incident in China was, um, that was my first like, uh, real experience, like as like a movie for, to me, it was almost like a movie mm. because it happened like a movie, you know, and it was def definitely a big wake up call and to put me to the test, uh, mentally, you know, so it was in Shanghai um new year's eve so prior to that they got a massive like uh where the shopping center is is a mall and stuff like that so i nice to just walk there daily just walk up and down get something to eat or whatever shopping um and obviously there's people there that come talk to you yeah just random people hmm. and they're trying to sell stuff on the street there so you know, people come up to you as normal, but I used to just brush them off. But this is one guy who would keep, every time I saw him, he'd just come up to me, say hello and where you going and whatever, blah, blah, blah. So then I, um, I had a, I was looking for a, like a, a laptop cover or Galaxy uh, iPad cover. So, and he goes, yeah, I know a shop. So he took me to a shop, helped me there, you know, and I didn't think nothing of it. He didn't ask for anything. So he just took me to the shop, come out, I bought something. We just started talking. Um, and he seemed, you know, he seemed pretty genuine. So we started talking about, he goes, what are you doing here? I said, I'm doing a bit of training and stuff like that. And he goes, oh yeah, my son, my son does training. So he showed me photos of his son, him and his son, and his son in like karate uniform and that. So that's where he got me because it was mm. legit. So, and then I said, all right, this guy's pretty cool. And he just started talking to him, sort of befriended me a little bit. Not that I hung out with him or nothing like that. And just every time I used to see him, I just have a chat with him. And then came New Year's Eve. And they've got a thing there in Shanghai. It's called The Bund, which is like a big concrete. It's, it's along the river. And they've got all the city buildings on the other side. And they have a massive light show for New Year's, the countdown. So I was heading out there, bumped into him, and I told him... Um, is there any way I can go to have a drink, like a bar or something, you know? So they don't have like bars like how we do here. They have karaoke bars. That's it. And all the karaoke bars are all upstairs. 
They're all up in buildings. That's how it is there. There's no open cafes and stuff like that. So he goes, yeah, he goes, I've got a friend. He goes, uh, I know a karaoke bar. I go, all right. I'll go have one drink just to relax, and then I'm going to go head out. So he took me up into his place. Uh, took me. We went into an elevator, took me to the building, went up there. It was about four stories up. You know, we, we walk in. It was a karaoke bar. I didn't think nothing of it, but it was pretty quiet. So I'm thinking about because everyone else was out into the streets. So I go into this room, and then he starts bringing out, uh, you know, all these these girls started coming out. And I'm like, man, I think he's taking me to the wrong place, you know? And I sort of wasn't interested. I ordered a drink. I had a drink. And he goes, he goes, I'll be downstairs. He goes, I'll meet you downstairs. Finish your drink. He goes, and I'll, I'll be out on like this. I said, all right. So anyway, those girls started to, to try to chat me up and I wasn't interested. So they left. And as I was drinking, then some other dude come in. So I was holding a tray with a bottle of Remy Martin. And it was him and two other guys. I say, come in, man, talking to me friendly. And he sits the, the tray on the table and he gives me the bill, the receipt. And he goes, oh, you know, this is for you. He goes, this is what you owe me. And I looked at the price and I'm like, and I don't know how much a Remy, Bar- Remy Martin bottle was, but this was expensive. This was a couple of grand. Mm. So he goes, this is what you owe me. I said, I never ordered this. He goes, well, the bottle's opened. He goes, it's yours now. And I said, man, I've already paid for my drink. I had one drink. Um, and I said, yeah, I'm not paying for that. And then I just, then I realized what was happening. And he goes, and then they put the curtain down. They had a glass door. And there was two of them sitting down. And it was him next to me. And then they put the, the curtain down on the door. And I'm like, uh-oh. And so there's no way to get out. There's no windows, nothing. So I'm stuck in this little room. And, and he goes, oh, he goes, where are you from? I go, Australia. He goes, well, he goes, welcome to China. Like this, you know? He goes, what do you think this is? He goes, it's New Year's. He goes, you got the room here. He goes, the girls that came in. He goes, everything costs, you know? And I'm like, all right. So I, I knew what was happening now. And this is when, you know, my brain just started going, oh, now what do I do? You know, so, and I had my phone and stuff like that. And he goes, what are you going to do about the bill? Like, I'm not paying for that. I go, I don't have the money to pay for that. You know, and as all this kind of stuff's happening, I could see where that door is a glass door. And I could still see probably, you know, there's a little gap at the bottom. It was clear. And I could see more feet outside. So there's more people outside. And I'm like, oh, crap. What do I do? Then this big dude walks in. (laughs) Big, biggest Asian I've ever seen. He was huge, wearing an army jacket, sat down. And I'm like, oh, man. So now they're threatening me to pay. Um, and this guy, if you've seen the movie, um, what's it called? Uh, the Hangover? Mm. You know that little that little Asian dude? Yeah. He's exactly, he was exactly like him. Okay. He's a little little mafia boss. I, later, later on, I found out that that were the triads. Hmm. Yeah. So, um, anyway, I was hated, got hated, argument, got calm, got hated, got calm. I ended up giving them money. So I had about $500 worth of Australian dollars, obviously in Chinese money. So I pulled it out. I gave it to him. Okay. This is all I got. That's all I'm giving, you know, cause there's three people in there, but at the same time, I'm looking at the people in the chair. Has are they pulling out weapons? Have someone? You know, I don't know what was happening. I was so my my antennas were going everywhere. Um, and I had my phone on the bench and I had my credit card in there. And he asked me, he goes, "Don't you have any more money?" He goes, "What about a credit card?" I go, "I don't have any credit card." And he goes, "What are you gonna do for money?" I go, "I don't know. I'll have to ring home or something, like this, you know." So he gave the money to the big dude, and the big dude counted it. Um, and they threatened to kill me. So I'm like, all right. And he's asking me, then they accepted the money and I went to get up. I grabbed my phone. Lucky they didn't take my phone because I had my passport on me too. And I said, if they touch my phone or my passport, well, this is where I have to make a decision now. You know, um, I'm not letting him take that. That's what I said. I'm not letting him take that. So I was looking at the glass. I'm like, I'm going to glass this guy. I'm going to do this <laughs> to this. 
<laughs> and th that's how I started to think. I had to, mm. you know? So I stood up, went to put my jacket on. He goes, what about your jacket? He goes, have you got anything in your jacket? So this is where I, this is where I sort of got, I sort of put my foot down and I ripped everything out of my jacket and I threw it at him. And I sort of said, man, and I put my hands out like this and I said, that's all I got. That's it. Hmm. And at this point, this is where I'd made the decision where I said, if something happens, for me, it was a life and death situation at this point. That's how I was thinking. Yeah. So I said, if I'm going out, I'm taking someone with me. That's it. I, go, I'm not, I have to. I had to change my mind. It's either you crumble or you don't. You got to fight. So this is where I say now it's Marshall, yeah. Mm. But at the same time, I had to keep my cool and know what's going on in my head. But yeah, after that, now he was all right. He goes, "Nah, no worries. All right." So let me go. I grabbed all my stuff, and surely when I opened the door, there was another four people out there. So mm. I was surrounded, seven in total. Mm. Mm. And I would turn left to go where I came in from, and he goes, "No, no, no." He goes, "Go this way." So I turn right. So there was another elevator. So they all walk him into this elevator um, and got in. I know one of them came in. It was one of the smaller guys that was in the room with me. So jump in, he jumps in, and they all they just, they just stayed behind. And I'm staring at this guy. He's facing one way. He's not looking at me, but I'm facing him. And I'm like, man, I can take this guy out now. That's how I was thinking. I can take this mm -hmm. guy out. But then I sort of said, but I don't know where I'm going. So I'm in the elevator going somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> so, yeah, I stopped. Uh, the doors opened and I was out into the street. And I'm like, is this like real? So I just stepped out, turned. I just stared at, stared at like a movie. You know, when you're staring at someone in the elevator and the doors close, that's exactly how it was. And I was free. And that was it. So, yeah, that was that part, man. And then obviously something else happened during um, – the light show where there was a big um, stampede, which I got caught in. I just made it out. And I think it was like 40, 43 people died mm. and 30 something people got injured. I just happened to just get out. That was so the was same there night. A, was there a feeling the same night, huh? Well, wow. was there a, like a, cause it was New Year's. Yeah, it was New Year's. So straight from, when I got out, I walked straight to the bun there to go finish off the year, you had to go see the light show. So, and I was walked up and then traffic started coming. Like people were just piling and piling. Um, and I, got, I was near the front and I just felt getting pressured, pressured, pressured. People just kept coming. So I was mm. getting a bit of claustrophobic, you know? So and I turned, turned around, I go, I gotta, I gotta get out of here. I was already in this mind of what just happened. So, and I go, how am I gonna get out? There's no way I can move, I can't move. I felt people touching my pockets and I was like, man, I'm starting to freak out a little bit. So I kept my hands in my pockets trying to squeeze through. So then I worked out that because people were trying to go forward so much that they're trying to fill in my gap. So as they sort of move forward, I slid into their gap. So I had to go one by mm. one like this. It took me a long time to mm. get towards the end of the stairs. So once I started getting towards the end of the stairs, more people, would, I was un, there was no control of it. No one, there was no... No one was governing how many people are coming up. So, and that's when the pushing started happen, happening, you know. There were surges of just people pushing, massive surge like a crowd. And mm. I could feel like, and I started to get a little bit paranoid because I could feel something was going to happen. And a lot of people, a lot of them were just oblivious, oblivious to what was happening. They just kept pushing and pushing and pushing. Eventually, I made it down. I got down. And in 10 minutes after I made it down, uh, that's when they got crushed. A stampede happened and they all crushed each other there. So there was mm. a big funeral thing the next day. And I didn't know until the next day it happened. And it happened exactly what, right at the spot, just near the stairs there where it happened. You know? <laughs> um, yeah. That was a pretty surreal night for me because after that, everything was gridlocked. Once I made it out, you could not move nowhere. So I sort of got stuck in a corner for about four hours. I just, I felt hopeless. I sort of just gave up and just sat there and I said, man, how much worse can this night get? Mm. Uh, so could you but, sense, could you sense any like a uh, sort of an, different energy b before the stampede or as the stampede? Like, yeah, definitely. I, 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 so I, yeah, I felt something when I was at the front. That's why I wanted to get out mm. because I knew that just people were oblivious to it. They weren't concerned about it, but I could feel mm. it. Because they were just kept forcing, they were just going forward, and there was, mm. you can't, you couldn't go any more forward. So obviously, there's an, the only way is to you're going to squash people. 
you're going to really crush people. And it was just flooding in. I don't know how many people that said that was there. But, yeah, I I sensed it. That's why I wanted to get out, mm. you know. Um, definitely I sensed it way before that. And that's what made me turn and, and uh, I had to get out. So luckily I made it. Yeah. Okay. And in all your, all your other travels, have you ever sensed something like that? Because I was in um, the UK. I was in Britain in I think it was 2011. I think there was a riot after a there was a police shooting of a teenage a teenage boy, and there was a, a riot. Um, yeah. So it was a sort of like they were burning down the whole city, basically, like um, sort of what's happening now. Like, but I was it happened, started uh, near White Hart Lane, and I was actually at the at the soccer watching a watching Tottenham play a soccer match, and. I actually, I was going to buy some gear from the merch store, but it was too big a line. So I, I just jumped on the, went to jump on the train. While I was waiting for the train, I could just hear, it was like the air was sucked out of the, out of the world. It was just, and it's like, uh, something's happening. And then you just yeah. sort of start hearing these noises. Then while I was on the way back um, home, there was like the whole city was basically, uh, grid locked on fire, like all the buses and trains were locked down and d- diverted, and so it was like pretty crazy. But yeah, I just I, wanted—I was just interested in knowing, like that that feeling of it, um, just that energy of yeah, the, sort I've, of the I've, been, I've had a lot of those feelings from many countries that I've, like my gut feeling, especially. Mm. Um, I've been in situations where my gut has said, "Man, turn around." Like I've put myself in certain ri- in, in risky areas. I like to adventure. Yeah, I like to yeah. sort of go into the unknown. Um, yeah, I, I know I've been in parts where it's dangerous, and I've sort of the biggest lesson I've learned is always listen to your gut, man. Your gut instinct is your guide. Um, that's a big thing I've I've learned. And you know, sometimes you need to think, nah, it's only my gut. You know, you don't listen to it. I listen to it. That's why it feels like that because it's telling you it's a warning sign. It's a universal, you know, universal, yeah, it's a universal language. warning sign and saying, man, you know what? It's not a good idea. You know, and I've walked into certain places, man. In Brazil, I walked into a favela. I didn't even know. Mm. I just kept mm. being oblivious, taking mm. photos. But then I noticed I started hearing whistles and people were running down. And I'm like, man, then I started noticing around my surroundings what was happening. Mm. And I quickly realized where I was. And I had to quickly turn around, you know. Like in the Philippines, it's happened. It's, yeah, I've, I've been, I've been sort of approached. Um, it, another one in China, which is, I got, I got stalked in a shopping center. Mm. Lucky, but I sort of turned it around at the end on him. Started stalking him, so I made it, I made it aware to him that I knew what was happening. He was following mm. me every. He followed me in every direction that I went, all the way up to the top until. I planned it to go to a section where he was trapped. There was a corner and he couldn't go anywhere. So, um, yeah, then he got up to this sort of, got up to that corner where I knew there was a dead end door. He couldn't go nowhere. So I just sort of went to the balcony area and I was leaning over. Like, but this whole time pretending I didn't know that he was following me, mm. but I knew. Um, so when he got up to the top, he turned the corner and I turned around waiting for him to come back out. So as soon as he come back out, he sort of he sort of froze and looked at me like face to face. I was staring right at him, and he just kept going. And then I started doing the exact same thing to him. I followed him everywhere. Hmm. So I sort of did a reverse psychology on him, and I started stalking him everywhere until he he was going straight out. So until he went out to the one exit at the bottom, and I turned to another one to go get my scooter. You know, but yeah, my antennas go on. I've learned a lot with traveling is to have your antennas up, man. Definitely, hundred mm. percent. That's what's, that's what's, that's what I've learned a lot with traveling is the intelligence, sort of straight smart intelligence. But we all we can all get caught, you know. Oh yeah. And I don't, I don't regret. I at that point I was I was frustrated with myself that I never thought that I could get caught because I thought you know I'm a bit straight smart myself. Mm. But you get caught, and I think there's some of the best lessons, you know. Um, I've been lucky, I think, with. Nothing that nothing serious has happened to me, but I've been in serious situations, you know, which um, definitely massive life lessons, massive life lessons. Yeah, like yeah. There's there's a lot of there's a lot of other stories. There's a lot, you know. But I could, like I said, keep going forever, <laughs> man. With these there's so many. Yeah, 
Yeah, we, maybe we can do another another, another interview and yeah. just uh, go into all the stories yeah. because, yeah, I know you've got a lot of c- cool stories, but, yeah, that was pretty, uh, yeah, that's a pretty full-on story in uh, China. That was pr- uh, I remember you telling us that the first time. I was like, that's crazy. It's like, yeah, what, man, the, that's hell one you, of my what biggest... the hell are you doing, Paul? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I wanted to go back, though. That was, you mm. know, to finish the story is the guys that I met training there, Shanghai Jiu-Jitsu, um, a guy named Stan, cool guy, very cool guy, top top guys there. Um, so I ended up going there and I told him what happened. And I said, I know exactly who this guy is. Um, I know where the place is. I remember everything. I mm. said, I want to go back and get him. <laughs> and they go, you sure? <laughs> you know? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, man. Because I, I was pretty upset that I got caught. Yeah, they, they caught mm. me, that, that it happened to me, you know? So that, this is now my ego, I think. You know, telling me now, no, I want to go back. Mm. You know, I want to get these guys now. I want to get this one guy. <laughs> so, and and these guys were all out, ready to help me. Man, they said, no problem. All right, we'll get a few people in. We'll get a few people uh, and all this kind of stuff. And they said, do you really think it's worth it? You know? Because that's they're the ones that told me it was the triads. You got caught by the triads and it happens with, mm. with you know, mm. with, obviously with foreigners. This is what they do. And I said... Yeah, and I really started to think, and I said, "Is it worth it?" Yeah, I lost five hundred bucks Australian, but I came out safe. You know, nothing mm. happened. Then I'm getting these guys in danger too. Well, I can leave if something happens, mm. and all this kind of stuff. So I just took it on the chin and I let it go, man. After that, mm. but I was very thankful with um, the, yeah, the guy Stan from Shanghai Jiu Jitsu. Um, yeah, look, he had my back, and he's just mm. met me. You know, so very, very cool guy, man. Very cool guy. So, yeah, that was that part. Oh, amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think, um, yeah, it's a pretty cool story. Is there uh, anything else you want to finish up on? Any, uh, yeah, I think that was a uh, pretty good conversation. Uh, just any a- any uh, positive notes for people during this uh, lockdown to get through it? And hopefully Yeah, positive we- notes, man, is... You know, the way I believe, this is why I say it. If you want to be a positive person, you've got to lead by example. You know what I mean? Mm. If you're a type of person that's, you know, especially through this, and I understand it's difficult, you know, and a lot of people can't handle it as mentally, you know, say, for example, as me. I know I'm mentally strong, but I still have battles. You know, this year was a battle for me. People, some people complain about six weeks closed. I've been closed for nearly nine months, mm. you know? And I cancelled everyone's memberships. I had no grants. So I'm getting job keeper. You know, how do you think I feel? You know, I'm no, you know, when people say my name, Paul, oh no, he's strong enough. Yeah, but I'm still human as well. You mm. know, I learned how to deal with this. I put myself in, in a situation where I have to I have to deal with this. I'm not gonna just let it beat me. Mm. You know, I can't sit there and feel sorry for myself. That's the way I, I see it, is struggles and difficulties are part of life. That's the way it is. You're never going to get away from them. If you're the type of person that's trying to run away from them, you're always going to be negative, you know? But if you embrace it and you say, all right, man, this is hard. This is going to be, it's a struggle. How can I, what can I do to make it more positive? What can I do with myself to make it better? How can I, you know, focus my energy somewhere? Learn something, do something, keep yourself active. Do something Mm. that you haven't tried before if you've got the time. You know, but one thing I've learned is just never give up, man. Never give up. I've never given up on this. Never. Not once. Not, that hasn't even come to my, in, in my mind to give up, yeah? If mm. I have to start again, I will. But to give up and say no, like, that's it, I quit, nah. You know? Mm. The only time you hear me say I quit is if they don't allow martial arts to be physical anymore. Yeah, you know? Yeah. So this is, this is the scary part for me. Um, mm. because I'm the top martial arts is, is contact. It yeah, always has contact. been, Yeah, you know? So that's a big part of martial arts training is the physical part of it, the contact. Mm. So this is the hard part for me. Um, and that's why I decided, you know, not to sort of open my gym now with those rules because it's just not viable for me and to mm. have a minimum those, you know, those numbers. And then it, it puts me in a situation where I've got to pick and choose. I'm not going to do that, mm. you know? Because I want everyone to be here. I want everyone to come and train, you know, mm. not pick and choose one or two people or six people, whatever it is, you know. Mm. So, yeah, we all got battles. Um, I dealt with mine. 
Um, and I'm going to come back positive. I'm going to come back much better, you know, and mm. I try to instill that in mm. others same way. you got to learn to deal with it. Sometimes, you know, sometimes it's not getting help from others. Sometimes you have to, you have to do it yourself. Mm. That's another big thing I've learned throughout my life is you have to be able to sort of go inside yourself and be able to find a way to deal with it mentally, you know. Mm. Yeah, you might not want to do it. Yeah, it's going to be, it's going to suck. It's going to be hard. You feel like quitting. But if you just quit, that's it. It's mm. done. Yeah. You've well, given it's up. Like I, yeah, because I say the grass is greener on the inside instead of on the, like the grass is greener on the other side. Because like if you tend to your that's inner right. garden, look after yourself and then you can yeah. look after others and, you know. Like they say, the grass is always greener where you water it. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. if you're always external, 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 searching, I need motivation from that person. I want inspired from this people, blah, blah, blah. Everything's external, mm. yeah, but it's always inside in the end. You can get all external things. Mm. You can watch a video clip that motivates you. That's all good, but th that motivation doesn't last long. You yeah, know? It's, you not, it's not your voice. It's, so, it's someone else's voice in your head that you're talking. You're not exactly. saying your voice. When you start telling yourself you can do it, Yes, I believe in myself. Yes, I can do this. You know, or I must do this or I will do this. Those words alone, you know, putting them into your brain changes you. But if you're always, mm. oh, I'm not sure, I don't know, you know, nah, I don't feel, I don't think it's going to work. If you, They're all negative words, mm. you know. Mm. So when you start putting negative words into yourself, that's what you're going to believe. That's, that's, that's facts, yeah. you know. But if you implement, even if you don't know something, you say, man, yes, I can. That's what I do. Hmm. Yeah, I can do this. I'm, I'm going to try it anyway. I yeah. know I'm going to fail too. Hmm. When I accept, I accept failure. I know yeah, I'm going to fail doing it, but I'm still going to do it. Yeah, failure is the learning. Exactly. People think hmm. failure is a loss. It's not. For me, failure is, is the opposite. I, hmm. I don't even say success. I say failure because failure is what is, that's the success. Hmm. You know, that's how you learn. If you're too scared to fail, you're never going to, you're going to be stuck. You'll just be stuck hmm. in that ditch all the time, you know? And that's, 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 that's real failure. You know, that, that's, yeah, that, no, I wouldn't say failure. I'll say that's a loss. Hmm. That's losing, you know? But yeah, that's, that's my sort of way of, you know, um, po positive stuff. You know, you got to be positive to yourself. You can't expect others to be always positive for you. You know what mm. I mean? You have to be strong for yourself too, you know, in, in times. That's the only way. That's another thing that's traveling has, you know, because I've traveled solo. Man, I was in that many situations where I've got no one to talk to. I've got no one to give me any kind of guidance. I had no one to inspire me or tell me or this and that. I had to work it out. I had to deal with mm. myself in that moment. How do I deal with it, you know, <laughs> mentally? So that's why I say it's good to be, you know, even though this part sucks this year, but it's kind of a good thing too because it puts all, it put all of us to the test, put mm. everybody to the test to see how you can handle your being with yourself, one, and dealing with this mentally. It's, mm. This year is not about physical, dealing with it physically. Yeah, it you can learn a lot about yourself. You can learn a lot about yourself. By being, um, being the observer and trying to observe, oh, look how angry yeah. I'm getting right now. Wow, that's interesting. <laughs> What's that? Look how angry I'm getting right now. That's interesting. You know, or look how sad I feel or look how whatever, you know. Yeah, well, I could have been like that too. I could have mm. been like that too easily. I could have let myself go and feel depressed, and especially from my, starting from my neck from the start of the year. Mm. You know, I could have just been down. But I, when I got to that point, I said, how do people, because I felt bad then. I was, I was 89 kilos and I didn't feel well, good. I didn't feel healthy. And I, and I sat down and I asked myself and I said, man, how do people allow themselves to continue feeling like this? I asked this myself. I go, I understand how that feels. I go, but then there's a choice of letting yourself stay like that or you make that change. Mm. Yeah, you better yourself. I decided to better myself. That's it. Hmm. I made a decision and I've stuck to it, man, the whole year. Excellent. <laughs> so, yeah, man. Well, I think that's a good message for everyone to uh, to take out there. So, yeah. All right. Yeah, well, hopefully some people can take something out of that, you know. But that's just, yeah. that's my own personal 
um, way and point of view. Hmm. Not everyone will agree. Maybe they will. I don't know. But it was a yeah. bit of the Bushido mindset in there and the sort of warrior, the sort of philosophy of the, the sort of Ronan philosophy as well. But yeah, it's, all, it's, it's the yin, yin and yang, man. That's what I yeah. call it with everything because it it's has to be a bad. a bad for good. Hmm. You know, yeah, exactly. cold and hot, you know, start yeah. left and right, love and hate. There's always hmm. an opposite like that. You have to, you can't have one without the other. You can't always say you want to be have a you know good life without any bad stuff. It doesn't hmm. work. That's yeah. where people get feel that depression because they're always wanting a good life and happy. And it no, it doesn't work that way. Hmm. You have to have bad times. You have to have down. Yeah. You know where you're upset and you're down. You feel depressed or anxiety on this and that. That's normal, hmm. but it's how you learn to deal with it. You know, yeah, that's that's the way I sort of see it. And this is coming from my own experience. Yeah, of how, that's mm. how I've dealt with it. You all can always come through if you if you just keep going. Yeah, always, always. That's it. Just keep your arms up. Yeah, man. That's it. You know, like I said, I'm. I feel good. Yeah, it's crappy. You know, it's a crappy year, but mm. I'm looking forward to reopening again. Um, like I said, I'm I'm doing private classes only at the moment. I've been doing outdoor private classes, so the group classes for me it's not viable because of the mm. the rules, um, which I think suck. It's almost like they're targeting gyms, you know, mm. um, with that with those kind of rules because everything else around Spe- me, especially with the num- numbers from New South Wales and around the world with the gym. Um, yeah, it's not even that. It's it's just looking at human behavior outside. Mm. You know, it's not even about the science and the facts and all this health expert advice. And it keeps uh, people it's not even calm. About that. Keeps What's people that? calm. Keeps people calm. Let, lets them like get some frustration out, like to be able to. Yeah, that's for sure, man. Mm. That's for sure. But when I say outside, you know, massages are going, random people touching each other, uh, haircuts are happening. People are sitting outside drinking, no masks and all this kind of stuff. And that's what frustrates me, saying there's no social distancing, the human behavior after all this. But yet gyms um, have this kind of, they have these rules in place that we can't go indoors and have this social distancing rules indoors of eight square meters. Like, yeah, that that's what sort of, that's what's frustrating me now mm. with all that. You know, so yeah. I feel like that's just they've targeted gyms for some reason because I don't know because it's good for you, you know, it's good for you. Okay, because well, it's good for you. <laughs> that's another t- whole three hour of podcast. We can, yeah, <laughs> we can keep going if you want to go down that road, but yeah, um, I think we'll leave it at there. Yep, uh, I think we might have gone a bit over time, but that's fine. Um, oh, thanks sorry, a lot man. for doing that. No, nah, thanks thank for you. doing that. Good. <laughs> Good to have a yeah, chat. I let uh, say I even let uh, got to uh, let off some steam a little bit. We're talking. Yeah, well, yeah, it's, it's always a human connection. Like even though we're online here, we're still uh, connected to the same ether. So yeah, you know, but better face to face. You know, way better face to face. That's face-to-face. it. But yeah, hopefully we'll see each other uh, pretty soon. Um, yeah, man, for yeah, sure. Even, um, for sure. Even with our jujitsu, now we can actually uh, everyone can actually catch up a, a little bit more. Yeah. Hmm. But yeah, yeah no, all right. I'm, I'm looking forward to it, man. All right, no worries. Okay, thanks for doing that. No worries, thank you, Sala. No worries, and there, and thanks everyone for watching, and we'll catch you next time. Us. See you guys. All righty, guys. I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. Uh, yeah, it was pretty full on, especially that China story. Uh, let me know what you think in the comments down below. Be sure to hit that like, follow, subscribe and share. Uh, be sure to check out my social medias down below, my website and all that. Uh, be sure to check out Paul's social media, his website. And when his gym opens, be sure to check out his gym as well. Um, yeah, so I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as me and we'll catch you next time. Ooh.